If you had to name one place, where do you think that Paul spent most of his time? What, what city, <clears throat> and of course not uh, the time necessarily of his youth, excluding his, his hometown, but in the work that he did as an apostle and an evangelist, where, where did he choose to go and to stay most often? Uh, I think mostly of the, the traveling Paul. And so he was here and there and yonder, for, here for a year and there for another place for another place for another time. But where did he most often choose to go? In Acts chapter 11 and verse 26, he was with this church for a whole year. And then he left from there and went to Jerusalem. And from Jerusalem then he returned back to this same place. He was there for some amount of time and then went away working with Barnabas, teaching, spreading the gospel. But then he came back and stayed there, the same place, a long time with the disciples. From there, he gets sent again for a completely different reason, uh, back to Jerusalem. He doesn't stay in Jerusalem, he's there, and then he comes back, and he's back at this same place again for some days. And then as he does, he goes away, visits uh, several different places, but then he comes back and spends some time again in this same place. Maybe if you followed along, you've, you've seen where this was. This is the city and the church that was in Antioch. Antioch was about 300 miles north of Jerusalem. And I don't know if I had just been asked without, without any notice, I, I might have thought, well, Jerusalem or Ephesus. We've got letters that he wrote to, to Ephesus. But Antioch, far and away, at least from what I could tell, is where Paul chose to return again and again and to stay more often as far as I can tell than any other place. So I want to think this morning about why. What was it about Antioch that kept Paul going back there again and again? And as we study that, we'll also see why, why did Paul leave? Why would he leave? But before we do all that, we might would first ask, well, why did he come for the first time? How did he get there to begin with? And so in Acts chapter 11, we find that it's, it's Barnabas' fault. Barnabas is the one who brought him there. So how did Barnabas persuade Paul to come there for the very first time? What did Barnabas say about the saints and the disciples in Antioch that persuaded Paul to go there at first? What do we know about Barnabas? What what could Barnabas have said? And we get just a little bit of that in Acts chapter 11, verses 23 and 24. Barnabas was sent by the, the church at Jerusalem uh, to Antioch to go as far as Antioch, and that, that's where he ended up. And verse 23, we get this little bit of the impression that was made by them upon Barnabas. Verse 23, when he came and had seen... <coughs> <coughs> had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So what could Barnabas have said to Saul? We obviously don't have a transcript of what, Paul, of what Barnabas said that persuaded him to come, but here we, we get the impression that was made upon Barnabas. And it said that he came and he saw the grace of God. <clears throat> Seeing what was there then, he didn't come and say, oh, well, here's all the things that you, you didn't know about. In fact, he doesn't really change anything. He just tells them what we are told, that he told them at the end of verse 23, is that, oh, you, you just need to continue. Continue doing what you're doing. And he continued doing the same thing that they were doing, going out and teaching. And so they, they were clearly uh, of a like mind. And so while we don't have a, a list here of, of names and, and specific details of things that he saw there that made this impression on him, what is said of Barnabas, I think it's safe to say, could be said of them. In verse 24, Barnabas was a good man. And so that could be said of the people there. Uh, the fathers, the mothers, uh, the relationships that, that the saints there had with each other on, on the first day of the week, 
and every other day where their lives overlapped and they worked together, there was good that was being done because there was good that was in them. Barnabas was full of the Holy Spirit last Sunday night. We looked at a variety of passages that talk about God in us and us in God. And so all of that, Barnabas, it was clear that Barnabas was in fellowship with God. And God was in fellowship with him. And so that, that's, who Paul, that's who Barnabas was. And when Barnabas goes to Antioch, it would have been equally clear that the same thing was true of those people. And then Barnabas, it says, was full of faith. And so that, that could be one summary of what it means when Barnabas saw that the grace of God was with them. Uh, well, what was said of him was equally true of them. <clears throat> well, what was the result of Barnabas coming? He, he was impressed by what he saw, but he didn't just kind of show up and, and admire uh, the, the people and the work that was being done and go tell other people how good it was. Uh, what we're told is he jumped right in. He was participating right alongside them. And in verse, the end of verse 24, the result was that a great many people were added to the Lord. But is that what was happening in Antioch because Barnabas came? Well, go back and look at the end of verse 21. What was happening in Antioch before Barnabas ever came? A great many, a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Barnabas didn't come and change anything there. He just contributed to the same kind of work and the same kind of results that were happening uh, that had him sent there simply continued. And so the, the work that we see being done here was not excitement that, oh, Barnabas is here. There, there's a new guy in town, so let's get busy. They had been busy all along. And the work simply continued. Their faith and zeal did not... Uh, uh, did not change significantly. I'm sure they were happy to have Barnabas there with him. What, what church wouldn't be glad to have someone who was given the nickname by the apostles, a son of encouragement. What church wouldn't uh, be happy to have someone move there and work with them. Uh, but that he was not the one who defined their faith. So all that to say, I, I don't think it's hard, even though we don't have a transcript of what Barnabas said when he went to Tarsus, and talk to Saul, I don't think it's hard, too hard to figure out some of the things that he may have said to him. And so, verse 25, Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. Obviously, between those two times of he fi him finding him and him bringing him, there were some conversations. And so, here are some things that Barnabas would have told them. So, Paul hears from Barnabas, a, a trustworthy friend and brother. He's persuaded enough by what he's heard to go, but when he gets there, will his expectations match the things that he heard? Will the church at Antioch live up to the reputation that, that Barnabas said? You, you've, we've all had that happen before. Somebody's really built your expectations up about this place you might visit or these, this meal that you're going to have. And so you've, you've got your sights set high. And so what's Paul going to see when he arrives in Antioch? Well, it's, it's clear he would have seen exactly the same kinds of things. And though we don't get the same insight into Paul's thoughts that we do Barnabas's of what Barnabas saw and what he said, there are two statements that are said about the church there that reflect exactly the same thing that Barnabas did. In Acts chapter 14 and verse 26 is, Paul and Barnabas had gone out and, and preached. They returned to Antioch one of the many times that they did. So they sailed to Antioch where they had been commended to the grace of God. That, that's, that same phrase that uh, is mentioned twice in regards to, to what Barnabas saw there, or, or maybe once. Uh, the same thing is said about them there. That, that Paul would have noticed the grace of God among them, and that was part of why they sent uh, Paul and Barnabas to go out. The grace of God was commended to Paul and Barnabas in the work that they were doing by the church there in Antioch. So Paul would have seen it then. And it wasn't a flash in the pan. It wasn't just a Barnabas and Paul just happened to be there on a good day and saw them at their best. In Acts chapter 15 and verse 40, Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. This is, again, of the church in Antioch. So, a point is that Paul consistently was seeing the same 
the same things in them that Barnabas had and that had been in them all along, even before Paul or Barnabas came. But most of these descriptions are pretty general. Uh, that they were good, full of the Holy Spirit, full of faith, the, the grace of God was there. Those, those are commendable things. And I hope those things would be said, be said of me and of us and of you. But what, what, what are the specifics of that? What are some specific things that Paul and Barnabas and others would have observed that would have led someone to say, well, the grace of God is there, they, and that they commend others to the grace of God? While there, I'm sure, are many things that we do not know about the church at Antioch, (coughs) so by no means do I pretend to think that everything we'll talk about is everything that was happening there, look with me at a few of the traits that we do know about the church there, and these are the kinds of things that would have brought Paul back again and again and again. First of all, in Acts chapter 11 and verse 20, <clears throat> Acts chapter 11, let's read 19 and 20. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene. Cyrene was over in Africa, northern Africa, who when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. Depending on your translation, you either may have Hellenist or Greeks. And and I think either one, the point is to the Greeks. Some were speaking the end of verse 19 to the Jews only, but there were some who were willing to go to the Greeks. Now what's what's significant significant about that? Do you remember once it said, I think it's in the book of John, that the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And that, that history is, is fairly well versed and documented and known. The, the Jews and Samaritans tended to not have anything to do with each other. But in Acts chapter 8, do you remember who went to Samaria from Jerusalem? Philip. Philip went to Samaria. Well, why did he go to Samaria? Jews don't have anything to do with the Samaritans. What, what changed his mind and changed his thinking so that he would go there? Uh, the Gospel did. And so he went to Samaria. And because of that, Paul, uh, Peter and John came. And, and so great work was done among those people. Well, at times, Jewish Christians, there was a temporary period where Jewish Christians were not going to the Gentiles, not trying to teach the Gentiles. At least most were not. But here in verse 20, there were some who did. And so this would have been noticed that these who came from Cyprus and Cyrene, they came to Antioch and they spoke to the Hellenists or they spoke to the Greek. And so at the the Greeks, and so at the time that Paul arrived, that that was the attitude. That was uh, the, the characteristic there. That was just the norm. That was the expectation that Jew or Gentile were going to go and we're going to teach them exactly the same thing. Paul would have noticed that. Maybe that's one reason that Paul continued to come back here because this was a church who taught the lost without without prejudice. Secondly, Paul might have continued to come back because this was a church who encouraged teachers to come to them. In Acts chapter 11, it it started, of course, without their choice specifically. Uh, Those of whom we read in verses 19 and 20 who came and brought the gospel first. Uh, Of course, they they were not invited as far as we can tell, and there were no Christians there yet to invite them, but they came. And so this church began and and started to grow. And then in verse 22, when news that a great number believed and turned to the Lord, when that news came to the ears in Jerusalem, uh, the, the ears of the church in Jerusalem, they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. Now, at first, we think, well, this is the initiation of Jerusalem, not of Antioch. But this includes Antioch, doesn't it? What, what if Barnabas shows up uh, on somebody's doorstep there in Antioch? Well, Antioch has the decision whether they want Barnabas to, to stay or if Antioch's going to say, well, thanks for coming, thanks, but no thanks, we're, we're doing just fine 
Uh, we don't need or want your help here. That, that was not their attitude. They welcomed Barnabas and, and the work that he did. And then in verses 25 and 26, <clears throat> again, this seems to be Barnabas' initiation that he goes to, to get Saul. But as he brings Saul back, again, the church can welcome him and, and the work that he can do and the help that he can offer. Or they can say, no thanks. Do you know any church that did that to Saul? Yeah, the church at Jerusalem did that. The first time he came to them and wanted to join them, they said, we're, we're not interested, at least at first, until Barnabas helped him. In verse 27, it's not just Paul and Barnabas. In verse 27, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. And then we hear about one of them, a prophet named Agabus, and he taught them, he spoke to them. So I believe this implies all of these prophets who came from elsewhere they were accepted. They were received. The, the church in Antioch was willing to listen to them. Over in chapter 15, chapter 15 and verse 31, <clears throat> after the controversy over circumcision had been brought to Antioch, and then it was uh, discussed further in Jerusalem, well then the things that were taught in Jerusalem, there was a letter that was written and distributed throughout several regions, and some brought that same letter to Antioch, verse 31. When they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Again, the church in Antioch was, was willing to receive and to hear those who brought that. Judas and Silas are named in verse 32. And then in verse 34, it seemed good to Silas to remain there, to remain in Antioch. He was sent from Jerusalem to help distribute this letter, but... Maybe for the same reasons that Paul and Barnabas did. He came to Antioch and he thought, I, I think I'll, I'll just stay here and work here. Uh, but again, it's, it's clear from, uh, you know, for example, 2nd or 3rd John, 3rd John, I believe, that John says the church there would not receive us and they wouldn't receive any who were with us. So just because a prophet, a teacher, or even an apostle came to some church in Jerusalem, Antioch, or elsewhere, that church would make a decision about whether they would receive the teachers who came. And time and time again, we see that the church in Antioch is, is willing to receive them. So while we're not given all the, the details of the work that Paul and Barnabas and the prophets and the other teachers there did, Paul described his work in Acts chapter 20 and verse 20 as publicly and from house to house. Uh, from from the, the list of different teachers that we read about in Acts chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. Or in Acts chapter 11, there's these prophets that are there. Or in Acts chapter 15, Paul and Barnabas are there. Other teachers are there. Now Silas stays. I, I suppose they didn't have an assembly long enough for every single one of these individuals to teach every, at every single assembly. There, was public opportunity, there were public opportunities for teaching. But then also there was teaching that was being done from house to to house. So this this shows a commitment to the te that the a commitment of the teachers, but teachers don't teach themselves. Committed teachers also work together when there are committed hearers. And so this is the attitude uh, that that this illustrates about the church in Antioch. They encouraged teachers to come because they were just as committed to hearing and to learning as Paul and Barnabas and Silas were committed to teaching. And so maybe that's why Paul came and came again and again. But also notice in Acts chapter 15, they, they welcomed teachers who came, but it wasn't as though they did so unconditionally, just an open door policy, uh, an, an open mic, anybody that comes, whatever you want to say, sure, everybody just comes. Everybody's welcomed here, no matter uh, what your beliefs are, what your ideas are. We just accept everybody. Well, that was not the case. In Acts 15 and verse 1, certain men came down from, Ju from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So I, I don't know all the details of how this happened, but this teaching was taught to them. But Paul and Barnabas withstood that. They refuted that. They disputed that teaching. And in verse 3, the church sent 
Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, uh, not to figure out what the matter was. Paul and Barnabas, Paul in particular, uh, knew quite well what the answer was to the question and the controversy of circumcision. So in verse 3, uh, the church in Antioch is, is taking their stand with Paul and the things that he was teaching. And so they, while they welcomed teachers, uh, they, they had discernment and they asked a few questions before they received the teacher and the teaching. And so this attitude as well encouraged Paul to come there and to come back again and again. But the church in Antioch wasn't a black hole. It isn't that teachers just went there to, uh, to die and to do nothing. Uh, the church in Antioch invited teachers to come, but they also sent, uh, sent teachers away. Look at Acts chapter 11 and verse 30. So Paul and Barnabas had been in, in Antioch together for a year. Bar Barnabas obviously for a little bit longer than that. And they were helping the, the work to grow there. And so it's interesting when uh, the church in Antioch decides to send some physical aid to brethren who were going to be suffering in other places. Who in verse 30 did they send away to deliver those funds? They sent Paul and Barnabas. Now, that's not so much a surprise. No doubt they trusted Paul and Barnabas. But doesn't it say something about the church? They were willing to send Paul and Barnabas away. I would like to hear Paul preach every Sunday. I would like to sit in Barnabas's class. But they chose to send them to deliver these funds. That while they were encouraged and benefited by having Paul and Barnabas there, they were not so dependent upon them that our work just can't go on unless Paul and Barnabas are here. They send them away, and this isn't even specifically that they're going out to teach. They're, they're delivering aid and relief uh, to brethren in another land. But that's not the only time. Go over to Acts chapter 13. So Barnab Paul and Barnabas are sent away in chapter 11, and what do they do? They come back. And so they're in Antioch for a while. And in Acts 13, verses 2 and 3, the Holy Spirit here specifically says, I want Paul and Barnabas to go out. And of course, the church at Antioch doesn't dispute that or disagree. And so in verse 3, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. And so Acts chapters 13 and 14 talk about where Paul and Barnabas go. But at the end of chapter 14, guess where Paul and Barnabas go last? come back to Antioch. And so they're in Antioch for a while. But then in chapter 15 and verse 3, where we read from just a moment ago, Paul and Bar the church at Antioch send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem. Is it that they just don't like him? They keep trying to get rid of him? No, they're, they're supportive of the work that Paul does when he's there. But they also recognize there's, there's work to be done in other places. Here's a unique situation. Paul and Barnabas and, and others... You need to go to Jerusalem. Go to Jerusalem where uh, our, our, our prayers are with you. Our, our help is with you. So in chapter 15, they send them away. The end of chapter 15, where's Paul, where, where are Paul and Barnabas again? They're back in Antioch again. And they spend some time there. And then in verse 40, uh, what, what's, what's Paul doing? He's going out again, but notice what's said about it. Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. They, they send him away again. Sometimes Paul's trips focused on teaching the lost. In Acts chapters 13 and 14, that was the main reason to go. Uh, but at other times, at the, in chapter 15, both the trip at the beginning and the trip at the end of the chapter, Paul states that his goal is actually to go to encourage and build up and strengthen Christians uh, in other places. So he's going to the lost, he's going to the saved, and the, churches, the church at Antioch's willingness and encouragement to participate and support Paul in that work is my guess, one reason that Paul continued to come back to Antioch. <clears throat> in Acts chapter 13, verse 1, this is a, a rare occasion where we have a, a list of names uh, of the teachers who were there. 
In Acts 13, 1, in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. We read about teachers here. We read already back in, in chapter 11, verses 22 and 23, there were teachers who came from Cyprus and Cyrene. And so the, the church already had teachers before Paul and uh, or Barnabas and, and Saul came there. My point is that on number, a number of occasions, we read about several teachers being in Antioch. One other occasion in Acts chapter 15 and verse 35, <clears throat> Silas decided to, to stay there after having been sent from Jerusalem. So Silas comes to Antioch. He decides to stay. Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch teaching and preaching the word of the Lord. But notice the next, how that verse ends. With many others also. There are many, not just many other, others are there. There are many others who are preaching and teaching also. Besides Silas, besides Paul, besides Barnabas, there are many others. So my question is, where did all these other teachers come from? And I'll admit from the beginning, I don't know for sure, but I can only think of two options. Either the church in Antioch was constantly dependent on somebody send us teachers. And that happened frequently. Jerusalem sent Barnabas. Jerusalem sent Silas and Judas. So they were very blessed to have a number of teachers who came from other places. And they were either exclusively dependent upon that, or they welcomed that. But on a regular basis, they were developing teachers from among themselves. And so, uh, I guess all we can do is guess, but from what we've read about the mind and the focus and the faith and the work among Antioch, I think it's safer to say that a sign of a mature or a maturing church is that they look among themselves and, and develop teachers among themselves. And hopefully it's already clear. When, when I'm saying teachers today, I don't mean someone who spends the majority of their time and their week doing the work of an evangelist. An evangelist is a teacher. But there's clearly a variety of work to be done in Antioch besides one individual doing that work. I don't think any church is going to thrive who consciously decides to be dependent on someone else to, to, send, <coughs> to send teachers. So this means, uh, so, so how, how did teachers develop? How do, you, how do you grow a teacher among a church? How does that happen? But well, it begins with the individual's choice. You, you can't force anyone to develop themselves to be a teacher or, or a prophet as they had there. So how were teachers happening if, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll acknowledge, can't prove this for certain, but if they were developing teachers, how did that happen? Well, that happens when, in the language of 2 Peter 1, you remember, add, add to your faith virtue and knowledge and godliness and self-control and patience, uh, those, those things. That, that's the root. That's what's happening beneath the surface of someone who maybe isn't a teacher yet, but who's in the process. <clears throat> it's someone who is adding to their faith knowledge. It's someone who's adding to their faith patience and self-control, which, which are needed in order to study. If you've ever taught a class, or you've just had a, a Bible question, you've had something you're trying to work through, it takes patience and self-control to, to study and to continue to study to rightly divide the word of truth. So where do teachers come from? Well, it starts with themselves. That there are people who are already interested themselves in learning and understanding and then being doers of the things that they learn. But just because someone is very knowledgeable doesn't mean that they're a teacher, does it? What's the other side of that equation? Well, back to 2 Peter 1. They're not just adding knowledge and patience in their study, but they're also adding brotherly kindness. They're also adding love, which is an interest in the good of others. So someone who develops their knowledge and is trying to grow in their knowledge to the best of their ability, then the, it clicks in their mind, well, I have something that I think could help others. 
And so in whatever way I'm wanted, in whatever ever way I, I'm useful, I, I want others to know what, what I have learned. I want others to be able to learn as I have learned to learn. And so it's that simple growth that Peter summarizes in 2 Peter 1, add to your faith and then abound in all of those things. Uh, that, that's the kind of, of growing and maturity that appears to be present in Antioch. And if that was present in Antioch, that would be one reason why. Uh, there would be teachers, many teachers there. And so if Paul noticed an ongoing interest in learning and in teaching and in developing new learners, teaching people the gospel, and in developing new teachers... I think that would be attractive to Paul. I think that could be a reason that Paul went back to Antioch again and again. In Acts chapter 11, we noticed earlier at verse 27 that some prophets came from Jerusalem, <clears throat> came to Antioch, and one of them said that there was going to be a famine in the land. And so in verse 29, the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So, obviously, Paul here notices they're willing to take what they have. And notice, the prophet said there was going to be a famine throughout, throughout the world, throughout that part of the world. Unless I misunderstand something, I think that would include Antioch. And yet, knowing that a famine was coming to them, each of the disciples, according to their ability, they sent funds to help brethren 300 miles away. What does that, that tell you about the thinking of the church at Antioch? Uh, did they take care of one another? It, everything we can tell, that would have been their mind. But maybe it had dawned on them how much interest others had shown in Antioch. People came originally in Acts 11 verse 20 from Cyprus and Cyrene and came and brought the gospel to Antioch. And then when the church in Jerusalem heard about what was happening in Antioch, Bar they sent Barnabas. And then Barnabas saw what was happening. And, Tar and Saul left his hometown and he came. He came to Antioch. Antioch was, I don't think they were totally dependent upon but they were greatly benefited by the love of Christians and churches in other places. And so maybe it dawned on them. Others have shown an interest in us. We, we need to keep our eyes beyond the borders of Antioch as well. And they did. And maybe that's another reason that Paul continued to come back to Antioch again and again. And then one more point, <clears throat> one more trait that is clearly a part of the church here is that they defended the gospel. We read earlier in Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 3 of this controversy over circumcision that was brought to Antioch from, from outside. And so they, they sent Paul to Jerusalem to defend the truth on this subject. And again, we read already, but verse 31, when that same, what Paul had already taught in Antioch, when that letter was written, uh, from the apostles and, and from Jerusalem, and it came. The same teaching was given, and they were encouraged over that. Uh, the point is, they were supportive of Paul and of others going to Jerusalem to defend the gospel. They were supportive of the teaching that was brought to them in defending the gospel against these who were uh, merging the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. So the church at Antioch stood for the truth, but they also stood against error. They were willing to defend the gospel. And maybe at first we think, well, isn't that just automatically? If you stand for one thing, then you're going to stand against other things? That, that should be obvious. But on more than one occasion, I've heard Christians say, well, we want to be known more for what we are for and less known for what we are against. And both the occasions that I've heard of that, it, it was brethren who were in the process of drifting and that was becoming gradually obvious. We want to be known for what we're for, not for what we're against. That's a reflection, kind of our get-along society. Let's just pretend everything is, is roses and tulips. Well, we love roses and tulips, but there's aphids, there's worms, there's blight, there's drought. 
but more important than some illustration, what, what about Jesus? Would that been, have been a motto of Jesus? Jesus ever say anything? Let, let's be known for who we're for and not who we are against. Well, how about just both? Jesus is pretty well known for what He is for. And He's pretty well known for what He is against as well. And so were the brethren in Antioch. They had exactly the same as pro approach. And never once do we read that Antioch distanced themselves from Paul. He, he was a bit controversial and he had a, a criminal record. He was sent to prison. And never once do we read that Antioch uh, back, backed away from him because of the results of his conviction and work. And so last, turn with me to Romans chapter 12. I want to read verses 6 through 13, and maybe you'll notice the same thing as, as I did as I read this. This is, of course, written to the Romans. This is not written to Antioch or even specifically about Antioch. But as I read these verses, see if you notice how many things in this short paragraph describe what we learn about the church in Antioch. Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 13. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Something was said about grace in Antioch. Let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. Chapter 11 and verse 30. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Point number one. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing steadfastly in prayer. Distributing to the needs of the saints. Given to hospitality. I think those describe a maturing church. I think those describe a church that has the lampstand. To use the language of Revelation 2 and 3. That sounds like a church that would encourage Paul. And a church that Paul might return to again and again. These are also some reasons that, that my father, as many of you know, has, has returned to the Philippines. Uh, he began going in 1995 and continues to. These are also some areas in which we can examine ourselves. And so tonight, as most of you know, Joel and I will be leaving about two weeks to go to the Philippines. So tonight, I want to use these same traits and, and talk a little bit about the, the brethren and the churches and the work there and help, help you to understand maybe a little bit more about the, the trip that we're going to make. And then we'll also look at these things as a means of examining us. Would, would Paul have come to Fairbanks once? Would Paul have come to Fairbanks twice? Would Paul have continued coming to Fairbanks? Maybe this provides a mirror for us to, to examine ourselves as to whether we be in the faith. Maybe it's clear. I hope, hope so. But... Teachers are not the most important part of God's people. That's, that's not the purpose of this lesson. But it's just that when we study and read about the church in Antioch, that, that is a theme that certainly rises to the top. But teachers don't define success or create success. God provides that. And God does that by using the faith of the teacher and by using the faith of those who hear. It's, it's their work together. Uh, that, that produces the, the plans and the work that glorifies God. And so that, that was the goal of Paul and of the church there. And let that be the, the goal of the work that we do publicly and from house to house. Turn your songbooks to number 380. We've all benefited from teachers. We all benefit from teaching. And of course, Jesus came to this earth uh, for many reasons, and accomplishing many things. One of them, though, being uh, the great teacher, the master teacher. And if you're here this morning knowing that you have separated yourself from God by ignoring the teacher, and ignoring the teachings of the Savior, then we sing this song to urge you to, to reflect upon why Jesus came to this earth, 
what he taught and how it applies to you. And if you're here and know that you're separated from God because of your sin, then listen to the master teacher. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Is that your need? Or if as a Christian you need to return to him? Or if in your own life, in some private way, you need to turn again with your heart and your soul and your, your mind to him? Then something in the song and maybe something that we've read will remind you of that. And if we can help you in some way, in any way, in serving him or serving him again, tell us how we could help you as we stand and sing.